Okay, so let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, we are studying the New Covenant and its superiority to the Old Covenant. We're hitting this same theme again and again as we go through these verses. Uh, you know, if, we, if I was able to encompass them and to, and to state what's in these verses quickly, we could be through it a lot faster. But I find so many things in here that remind me of the things that, uh, of the gospel and the uh, doctrine of salvation and so much interesting uh, to me uh, that you have to suffer with me going through the same theme over and over again. Well, last time we talked about the fact that death accompanies the validation of a covenant. We're going to take that same theme and expand it today as we consider the topic cleansed by the blood. Now, our title may seem improbable if we stop and think about it logically. Uh, how, it is very familiar in our circles. We've just been singing about it, cleansed by the blood. Now, <clears throat> when I've gotten blood into clothes before, that is not usually a cleansing factor. It's usually one of the hardest stains to get out. Uh, you have to use uh, a lot of effort, and sometimes the garment is ruined. So, cleansed by the blood, what do we mean? Well, as I was thinking about this, cleansing and all this, uh, the subject of laundry detergent, detergent came into my mind, and I recalled some of the slogans that were on TV when I was a lad, they were advertising laundry detergent. And uh, some are obvious, they include the uh, name of the detergent in the slogan. Uh, I remember Trust Tide to get clothes clean. And when I was looking this up, I discovered that Tide was one of the very first laundry detergents invented in 1943, I think it was. Before that, they used soap flakes to get clothes clean. And I don't know what all else. They probably tried different things. I'm sure the ladies were quite inventive, but t Tide... Apparently, it was one of the first laundry detergents. I also remember all temperature, all temperature, the cheer laundry detergent. You didn't have to uh, wash it in hot, all temperature. You could wash it, whatever. That was good for us guys because we didn't know what we were doing in the dorms. All right, now I'm going, I've got several slogans here. I'm just going to see if you can recognize them. Some are more current, some are, you know, from ancient history, like in the 70s. You know, so here's one. It does more than the wash. Who knows what that one is? It does more than the wash. That's from 1972. That's Clorox. It does more than the wash. Okay, the April fresh smell of, I heard somebody say it. Downy, there you go. Downy, that's from 1973. All right, gets the tough stains out. Anyone know that one? This is 2009, pretty modern. Gain. Pardon me? Gain. No, not gain. OxyClean is this one. All right. Uh, it's that fresh. 2008 slogan. It's that, not Purex. Febreze, Febreze. I guess they're not all laundry detergents. Okay. <clears throat> this site said all laundry detergents. Some are UK, some are US. Uh, so I tried to take, take just US ones because that's what we're familiar with. Okay, for the toughest grease use, Dawn. Somebody got that one. Okay, that's the 2005 slogan. All right, the smell of clean. Anyway, that's Pine Sol from 2001. All right, one last one. <laughs> this one kills me. I remember this one on TV. It's from 1975. The blank softens your hands while you do the dishes. Oh, everybody knows that one. And these stupid commercials. It was, this woman is the manicurist, and she's sitting there. The woman's got her hand in this bowl of liquid, and, she's, and the, the manicurist is talking about the value, advantages of Dawn. And then she says, you're soaking in it. It's like, oh, it drives me nuts. But you see, you remember it. That's the whole point of these slogans. Yes. The white tornado. What's that one? Cleans like a white tornado. What's that one? I don't remember that one. The white tornado brand. <laughs> uh, Mr. Clean? It could be. Yeah. All right. I don't know, but there's, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I, I only limited myself to a few, but you get the idea. Uh, 
All right, so I deter learned that detergents use chemical compounds called surfactants. Now, that's a shortened form of a three-word phrase. These compounds do two things. They attach to grease molecules, and then they, and they repel water molecules. And so they end up, uh, uh, they interact with the grease in the wash, and, and um, they end up creating tiny spheres of dirt and grease that are attached to the surfactants. And when you rinse it out, it all goes away down the drain. That's the whole idea. Your clothes are cleaned. Well, all right, so we've been talking about cleaning clothes. We like clean clothes. But think of my title again, Cleansed by the Blood. How many of you would think of cleaning something with blood? <laughs> Probably not, all right? But the idea is in our text, so let's turn there now. Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to begin in verse 16. Oh, I plan to begin in verse 16, but I just put verse 18 on the screen. So that is what we'll do. We'll begin in verse 18, uh, and that is our text. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. According to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. All right, so that's our text. Our proposition for today is this, the blood of the covenant cleanses the sinful soul changing it utterly. All right, so we're going to look at the first verse. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. And I'm calling this point proposition, the necessity of blood. That is the proposition. Blood is necessary. All right. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. So the verse sort of forms this propositional statement. It rests on the general statement of verses 16 and 17. That's why I had intended to read it Earlier, verse 16, for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it, for a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. Now, we're really talking about the new covenant. We're talking about the inauguration of the new covenant, inaugurated by the death of Christ on the cross, all of these things that we are a uh, big part of our uh, doctrine of salvation. But now he is going back, even the first covenant. That word even implies that the first covenant is lesser than the new covenant. But even though it's lesser, it still also required blood for inauguration. Now this word inauguration, or uh, translated inaugurate here, is... Uh, is an exclusively biblical and ecclesiastical word. It doesn't occur in secular Greek. It appears to have been coined in the Old Testament as the Jewish scribes are translating the Old Testament scriptures into, uh, into Greek, and it has been used, it is used a few times in the New Testament. Now, it is translated as dedicate or renew in some Old Testament passages. For example, Deuteronomy 20, verse 5, the officers shall speak to the people, saying, Who is the man that has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him depart and return to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle, and another man would dedicate it. So that's that word, the Hebrew word there, uh, is translated in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, with this word that we have translated here, inaugurated. Another one, 1 Samuel eleven fourteen. Then Samuel said to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So there it's translated renew. So rededicate, you could say. Uh, it has the form of valid, uh, it has the idea of a formal validation or initiation. Um, uh, it, as we said, it can mean a rededication. So, uh, so in this passage in for Samuel, Samuel is encouraging the people to make a renewed commitment, 
to take a formal step. We're going to renew the kingdom. We're going to start over again, but we're going to formalize this with a bit of a ceremony, a bit of a, a commitment to this idea. According to the lexicon, this word uh, then has two meanings, to give newness to something, so it's something in the sense of renew something, that's one way, or to bring about the beginning of something with the implication that it is newly established, so ratify, inaugurate, or dedicate. So the idea here, first of all, is that the first covenant was inaugurated with blood, proving, proving covenants must be inaugurated with blood. So just as he's made this idea, the blood is necessary, and he says that the, the, uh, that the covenants are inaugurated by blood. Well, even the first covenant, so this proves, his statement here, his proposition, proves that idea. That's what he's trying to say. All right, so let's move on to the next couple of verses. Uh, actually, the bulk of our verses for this passage, verses 19 through 20. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law... He took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. So point number two, demonstration, the first covenant and blood. So this is what this passage is talking about. He's actually referring back, when he's talking about inaugurating the covenant, verses 19 and 20, he's referring back to Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 24, and verses 3 to 8. So I'd like you to turn there. I'm not going to put this on the screen. So Exodus 24, beginning in verse 3, and we're going to go through to verse 8. Now we should say a couple of things. He's at the foot of Mount Sinai. You remember, back in... Uh, uh, they they uh, left Egypt. The exodus has happened a few months be prior to this. They leave Egypt. They get to Mount Sinai. They meet with God. The cloud of God descends upon the mountain. There's a day, a special day, where they gather together. And God from the mountain, a very mighty voice, uh, says to all the people the Ten Commandments. Now, here you are. You're in a... Well, in our society, we are... Aware, we are um, uh, with our technology, we can uh, uh, hear a disembodied voice and not be s freaked out. If you're in a big stadium, the stadium announcer is speaking over the speakers. And he is, uh, you hear a voice, but you see no man. <laughs> you know. Well, it doesn't freak you out, but you think about it. You are in a society where the loudest thing you've ever heard, the loudest voice you've ever heard is maybe a crowd of people and somebody you know, uh, calling everybody to attention like I do at lunch here. Uh, we get ready to pray. Well, uh, here you are gathered and there's this huge cloud on top of the mountain and you hear a voice shouting out, you shall, uh, 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 you shall have no idols, uh, you shall not murder, you shall not uh, commit adultery, all these things. That would tend to freak you out, don't you think? Hearing a disembodied voice like that, everybody in the whole nation is hearing this, and so they are very frightened. They send Moses to God. They say, you talk to him, Moses. We, we can't handle it. And so this is also, okay, Exodus 24, pre-tabernacle. So the tabernacle has not even been revealed yet. Mo uh, Moses doesn't know he's going to build a tabernacle. Doesn't know anything about it yet. And it is pre-priesthood. Aaron has not been singled out as the priest at this point. So these are all the things we need to note in the setting. So let's go through, and I'm going to read the verses. We'll make some comments, beginning in verse 3. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the Lord, words which the Lord has spoken we will do. And he's talking there about Exodus 20, 21, and 23. All of those words, okay? Moses... Uh, uh, Moses wrote down all the words of God. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. So you'll notice in our text in Hebrews, which we have on the screen, when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and so forth. All right, so here we are in this setting. They're at the foot of the mountain. Moses has now returned to the people. He is reading to the people the words of the law so as he has had it revealed to him so far. The people have sworn they will obey. 
All right, so he's built this altar, and he's built 12 pillars around the altar for the tribes, uh, representing all the tribes. In verse 5, he sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. So the offerings are offered. It doesn't tell us how many. There's 12 tribes. It doesn't tell us how many young men, but there's multiple, that's in the plural, multiple offerings. All right? And these young men are representatives of the whole nation. Whether it's one man from each tribe, we don't know. Could be. Don't know that. But in any case, they're offering sacrifices. And they are, uh, uh, let's see here. Where am I at? That was verse 5. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Right, so the blood is then taken uh, it is divided, and then the altar itself is dedicated with this sprinkling of blood. Now, our uh, Hebrews tells us that he used the branch of a hyssop plant and scarlet wool to take and shake that water or that blood onto the altar. Um, there's a little bit of extra detail added in the Hebrews account. We'll talk about that in a second. All right, so verse 7 is where we're at. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient. This is repeated twice in this passage. The people are making a covenant with God. And then verse 8, so Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Presumably, this is the blood that was in the basins. And how does he sprinkle it on two million people or however many there were there? Well, he takes it and he shakes it in the air in their direction. That's the idea. It is a dedication of the people. The altar represents the place of God. Then the, uh, the uh, sprinkling of the blood on the people represents that connection of the people with God, the covenant that is being made between people and God, that division of the sacrifice between man and God. All right, verse 9. Then Moses... Uh, uh, did I read verse 8? I think I did. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses, uh, sorry, and that's, oh, that's where I want to stop. Sorry. Verse 8. Okay, so Moses sprinkled the blood and offers the quotation. Now, this quotation is what is cited. If you look at verse 20 in Hebrews 9 on the screen, saying right there at the end of that section, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. He's quoting there Hebrews, excuse me, Exodus 24, verse 8. Now, as I mentioned, there's some additional details that are in the Hebrews passage. The source is unknown. The commentaries have had a lot of suggestions about where he got this information. Uh, and this goes way back, right to the very beginning when people started commenting on this passage, uh, way back in the early part of the church. People have been wondering about this because these things, some of these things aren't mentioned in Exodus. For example, the blood mixed with the water. Notice it says, with, uh, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled the people. So water isn't mentioned in the Exodus passage. Now, it was a practice of the Jews at a later time to mix water and blood in their sprinkling uh, ceremonies. But we don't know where he, the writer of Hebrews got the information about the inauguration of the covenant. Also, the scarlet wool and the hyssop are mentioned in Hebrews, but not in Exodus. So that's a little difference. The sprinkling of the book is mentioned, but maybe it's by virtue of the book then as it's placed on a shelf or something on the altar where the, where the uh, sacrifices are being made. That is maybe part of what is going on with that. But anyway, there's these things that we are a little uncertain about where they come from in the Hebrews, uh, the writer's understanding. And there's also one difference in the quotation, and this is what I really want to call your attention to, where he says, this is the blood of the covenant which, the, which God commanded you. In Exodus, Moses says, behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Instead of behold, in Hebrews, it says this. Some commentators, this again goes way back, think this is influenced by Jesus inaugurating the new covenant where Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Now, 
That seems very um, attractive, but modern commentators argue against it and say, no, that can't be correct. But what is the point of this? The point of it, this is, he's, the word this is pointing to the ratifica ratification or inauguration of the old covenant by the blood of the sacrifice. This blood. This is the blood that is a sign of the covenant. All right, so that's the first picture of inauguration that we have in our uh, passage in Hebrews. The first demonstration, the first covenant in the blood. The second one is in Leviticus 8. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to go there and read that whole chapter. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll just mention it to you if you want to take notes. You can look it up later. But when you go read that chapter, you're going to find several things are sprinkled in that chapter as well. Now, this is the dedication of the tabernacle. The tabernacle itself has been built now. The, the, the priesthood, the uh, priesthood of Aaron has been uh, named by now. And there is a, there is a new dedication. When we have, at the foot of Mount Sinai, we have the inauguration of the covenant. But now we have the tabernacle built. So there's a dedication of the tabernacle. Another inauguration. Okay? Another beginning. Right? So the same kind of ceremony is repeated. So, for example, in verse 19 of Leviticus 8, Moses sprinkled the altar of the tabernacle with blood. And then Moses marked the ears, thumbs, and toes of Aaron and his sons. I think the right ear, the right thumb, the right toe. So you get this smear of blood. So that's the left side. This side. Okay, here, this thumb, and the right toe. That was part of the ceremony. And then he sprinkled the altar again. That's in verse 24 of Leviticus 8. And then it says, verse 30, So Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron, on his garments, on his sons, and on the garments of his sons with him. And he consecrated Aaron, his garments, and his sons, and the garments of his sons with him. And so there is this sprinkling ceremony, inaugurating the priesthood, inaugurating the tabernacle, and, uh, and sprinkling the garments of those who are officiating. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the relationship of the blood to the covenant. It is the inauguration of the covenant at Sinai. It is the, at the inauguration of the tabernacle. One of my commentators says this, the act of sprinkling the blood sealed the ratification of the covenant while the peace offerings attested to the fellowship between the covenant partners. Remember way back there in Leviticus, excuse me, in Exodus, there, when they offered at the offerings, uh, they offered burnt offerings, that's where the whole animal is burned up, and they offered peace offerings. That's where only part of the animal is brought uh, burnt up. The rest of it is cooked and is distributed as a meal to those who are participating, to those who are in fellowship with God. That is the idea that is going on with those sacrifices. And so with the blood, that covenant is ratified. There is an agreement made between God and man. The blood covers the sins of the people and allows the man to come into the presence of God. And that's what we're going to see in our last verse, verse 22 of our text. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Here's our point. Resolution. Spiritual life. Spiritual life by the blood. Spiritual life by the blood. The first thing I want to talk about is the universality of blood in first covenant religion. Notice it says here, the text says, almost all things. By the way, in the New American, it says, one may almost say. You'll notice that one may and say are actually italicized. They're trying to help us understand, but in this case, I think they're getting, away, uh, getting in their way of themselves. We could simply say, according to the law, almost all things are cleansed, cleansed with blood. What does that mean? Well, there were some things that were not cleansed with blood in the Old Testament ceremonies. I have a long quote from F.F. F. Bruce, 
I think I'll read it. I hope I didn't put it on the screen, so just listen carefully. I'll try to point out the various things. Indeed, our author goes on, almost everything which requires to be ceremonially cleansed under the Old Testament law must be cleansed by means of blood. Almost everything, but not absolutely everything. There were certain exceptions. For example, an impoverished Israelite might bring a tenth of an ephah, four pints of fine flour to the priest as his sin offering instead of a lamb, or even instead of two turtle doves or young per, uh, pigeons. Leviticus 5.11. So in other words, the person who didn't have means, there was a way for him to still have access to God, and he didn't have to have an a sacrifice an animal in those cases. In Numbers 16.46, atonement was made for the congregation of Israel after the destruction of Korah and his company by means of incense. And so the incense was burned and it was wafted over the people and it was as a covering for the people. In Numbers 31, metal objects captured in war were to be purified by fire. In Numbers 31, Verse 50, the Israelite commanders in the fighting against Midian brought the gold objects which they had captured to make atonement for ourselves before the Lord. So they offered the gold objects to the, uh, to the priesthood, to the tabernacle, and that cleansed them. But such exceptions, Bruce says, were rare. The general rule was that ceremonial cleansing or atonement had to be effective by means of blood. So what is the point of cleansing? Why is it that we clean anything? You know, a, a, a shirt or a, a pants or a dress are all just as functional, no matter whether they're clean or not. They do what they're supposed to do. This week at camp, I had this. I was so brilliant. We all were packing all kinds of things, and I I got to where I uh, I had gotten out several shirts to take with me to camp. I hung them up in my office because I was grabbing a couple other things in my office at home. And I said, I've got to put those in the truck. And sure enough, I drove off and they were still hanging there. I thought, well, maybe I can make it. Okay, okay. the first day, we're there in the hot sun setting up all those tents and canopies and I'm sweating like mad. And then uh, we had all other activities going on. And then the next day, I thought, well, okay, maybe I can make it. Maybe I can make it. Well, then I, you know, I spilled breakfast on my shirt. And I'm an old man, you know. And so, and then there were other, and I could see, it's getting dirty. Uh, and, I, and, you know, and you put it on, it's sweaty. It's gross, isn't it? You ever, have you ever put on clothes like that? Now, sometimes you have to. Okay? Sometimes when you're going to go work out in the garden and you don't want to ruin your nice clothes, you use junky clothes. But you know, I went to Walmart and got another shirt. Okay, I couldn't handle it. Okay, okay now that, that might be amazing to some because I'm not really much on cleanliness if you look at my office. But, okay, but, okay, here's the thing. We wash things to remove grime and pollution. I don't know if that shirt is ruined. It could be ruined. It's so It was so dirty. My wife's going to have to wash it tomorrow. We will see if it makes it. I put stain remover on it. Okay, We will see. But that's like sin. The sinner is polluted by sin. When you sin, it is like you are just wallowing in the mud. You are letting the grime affect you. And if you stay in sin, you get dirtier and dirtier spiritually. And you become, and in fact, the picture of the Old Testament is that the sinner is barred from access to God. The sinner can't come to God. We've been talking about the holy place and the holy of holies and why uh, you cannot enter in those places with sin. All right, we've seen how even any little deviations in the Old Testament, any little deviations from God's plan and God's law brings God's judgment in some cases. You think of uh, Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus, and this right near that passage we were looking at, chapter 8, it would be about chapter 9, I think, where they, where they offered strange fire before the Lord. Not, we don't know exactly what that means, but it was, it was a contrary to what God had commanded. And fire from the altar leapt out and killed them. 
We think of the man, now what's his name, who was, uh, they were transporting the ark, and David, uh, when David wanted to bring the ark from where it was into, the, into Jerusalem, and there was a man that reached out, what's his name? Azza. Okay, how could I forget Azza? Okay, so Azza reached out. What happened to Azza? And what was he doing? He was just trying to steady the ark. But the God does not, God is holy and he does not allow sinners into his presence. That's the picture. That's a picture of all this grime that is associated, or this picture of, uh, of uncleanness that is associated with sin. The sinner is polluted by sin and he's barred from access to God. But here's what happens. The sprinkled blood cleanses him and allows him access to God. It, it becomes, when the sprinkling of the blood comes on him, it is as if he has died. The, the, the mark of death, a substitute death, is on him. He's sprinkled. His sins are mortified, put to death. The blood of the victim, another picture of it, covers his sin. And him, so he can come before God. He can come into God's presence. This is what happens on the Day of Atonement. The people of Israel, the whole nation is cleansed. They can now bring their prayers to God. They can come into his presence. They can have communion, they can have communion with him. All right, so according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed by the blood. Okay, with the blood. But there's something more. It's not simply cleansing that we need. It's not simply that we are, our sins are covered. The word uh, atonement means covering. Yom Kippur. Kippur is a covering. So our sins are covered. So God allows us into his presence. God gives us access. But we need more than that. We need the last part of this verse. And without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness. This is the resolution, spiritual life by the blood. There is no forgiveness without the blood. You must have the blood for forgiveness. It is essential. Throughout this passage, we've been seeing this. Back in verse 7, and back in Hebrews chapter 9, I should go there. In verse 7, it talks about the high priest enters once a year into the Holy of Holies, not without taking blood, not without blood. It is essential to the inauguration of the covenant, verse 18, which we just read. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. Not without blood. And now here in verse 22, it is essential, excuse me, it is essential for forgiveness. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The bottom line is forgiveness. It's placed last in the verse for emphasis, in the English and in the Greek. What else did the blood do in Hebrews 9? In verse 7, it gave access to the Holy of Holies, as we mentioned. It purges the conscience in verse 14. The blood, the forgiveness, the, 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 the sacrifice actually achieves that inner relationship with God that comes through the new covenant. It inaugurates the covenant, as we said, saw in verse 19. It consecrates the people, verse 19. It cleanses the tabernacle and the vessels, verse 21. It cleanses almost everything else in first Corinthians. Uh, covenant religion. And now, here at the end of our passage, it brings forgiveness. Westcott had quite a little line on this one. He says, it is this, it is the power of a pure life which purifies. You see, the sacrifice had to be of an animal that was without blemish and without spot in order for it to be a proper sacrifice before the Lord. You didn't bring an animal that had a broken leg. You didn't bring the, uh, the uh, disease-ridden runt of the litter and say, okay, well, I'll, I'll give this one to God. It's not going to cost me too much. That's not how it works. You bring a perfect specimen. If you are breeding in, in the uh, animal breeding world, they have standards for various breeds. If you have a purebred sheep or a purebred uh, dog or a purebred cow, they have standards. Uh, and, and the cow that, or the dog or the sheep that meets the standard of the breed, that is the best of the best, best of show. And so what God is asking for when you bring a sacrifice is it's got to cost you something and you bring the best of the show, the pure animal. The pure animal. 
And that sacrifice purifies. It is the power of a pure life, Westcott says, which purifies. But of course, we're not talking about the Old Covenant. We don't come to God anymore by the Old Covenant. We come by the New Covenant. We come because the blood has been offered once. It has been offered through the death of the most pure person who ever lived. And he offered himself so that his blood would purify us, his blood would cleanse us, his blood would make us free, and his blood would achieve forgiveness for our sins. The bloodiness of the first covenant religion is essential, but the blood of the new covenant is finally and fully efficacious. John Chrysostom, who was a preacher in the 300s, okay, in the 300s, this is, what is that? 1,700 years ago, maybe bit, somewhere in there. He, went, he wrote, we have some of his writings, his sermons on Hebrews. In this passage, he says, he's talking about the sprinkling of the book. Now, he, he's spiritualizing a little bit, but he's doing this by way of application, I think. He understands what the text means. He's accepting what the text means. But then he talks about, it says in this passage about the writing, let's see, he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. So he's going to spiritualize this a little bit. I just want you to understand that. Here's what he says. Where then is this? Is the book? He purified their minds. The blood is sprinkled on them and he purified their minds. They themselves were the, then were the books of the New Testament. But where are the vessels of the ministry? They are themselves. And where is the tabernacle? Again, they are, for I will dwell in them, he says, and walk in them. In other words, he's saying in the New Testament, the people of God become the temple of God, the tabernacle of God. God comes to dwell within them. And so when, when, the, when the blood of Christ is applied to your life by faith in his sacrifice, you are purified. It is the power of a pure life which purifies. In other words, it's not just symbolical. It's not, in the Old Testament, when, he, when he's sprinkling blood on these various items, on the people and on the book and on the altar and on the tabernacle and so forth, that's a symbolic cleansing. It's not an actual cleansing. But what happens in the New Testament is when the blood of the New Covenant is sprinkled in a spiritual sense, by faith, on the believer, he is actually really, internally, and completely purified. The believer by the blood of Christ becomes the vessel for the life of Christ to be displayed on the earth. That's what it means to be a Christian. Now we, we all sin every day, I'm sure. But our whole heart, our whole goal, our whole uh, effort, Ought to be lived to be to live to glorify the God who purified us from our sins. He has given us eternal life. We dare not pollute our life deliberately by sin. We need to walk with Him. Our goal should be to walk with Him. When we sin, we should seek forgiveness. We should turn away from it. We should change our habits. We should change our vocabulary. We should change our associations. We should change the things that we do. We should stop thinking out of our own things and start thinking about Christ's things. That's what happens. The proposition, the blood of the covenant, cleanses the sinful soul, changing it utterly. Are you cleansed? Then live as a vassal for the master. Cleansed, presentable, useful for the Lord's work. What about those who are still in unbelief? I'm sure there's people who hear me preach quite regularly and they just listen because they're because they have to be here or they are here for whatever reason. But they don't really believe. All I can say then today is to turn from your sin, turn to Jesus Christ and be made whole. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this word of God that speaks to our hearts, this cleansing and forgiveness that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that there would be a real change in our lives, that we would reflect the Lord Jesus Christ every day, 
that we would turn from sin and walk with you. Lord, we pray that you would help us in our weakness and our failings. Help us to turn again, to get up and turn again. We pray for those in our group here who maybe they don't know you. Lord, we pray that they would see themselves, that they would believe, that they would turn, that they would repent, that they would walk with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.